The Musical Poetic Mind, A Journey Through the Neuroscience of Popular Songs Chapter 2. Vocables in Songs, A Right Brain Perspective In the previous chapter, we discussed the two elements of proto-language in songs, interjections and vocables. These two elements serve different functions and evoke distinct feelings in the audience. Interjections are concise and straightforward. In contrast, vocables are somewhat mysterious, possessing an inexplicable magic. They are like a viral code that captures your brain, quickly spreading among people and becoming a popular imitation game. Long ago, these unique vocal sequences might have been a community's secret code, helping to identify insiders and outsiders. In today's internet era, familiarity with certain vocables and their associated dance moves seems to be an indicator distinguishing the trendy from the outdated. The vocables in songs often serve to unify a group, conveying a message of, we are in this together. From this perspective, the modern use of vocables in singing can be seen as a form of atavism, reflecting a deep-rooted connection with ancient traditions. These vocal expressions may actually echo the primal chants that were integral to early human societies. In many cultural traditions, it is common for ceremonies to incorporate chants. The essence of these chants isn't found in their literal semantic contents, but rather in their role in preserving the ritual's structure and atmosphere. These chants, often rhythmic and repetitive, serve as a unifying force synchronizing the participants' emotions and actions. This aspect is further explored in the book Language in Thought and Action by Hayakawa and Hayakawa. The book's chapter 6, titled The Language of Social Cohesion, emphasizes that in the context of modern communal events, the exact meanings of phrases sung or recited together often take a back seat. Instead, the primary impact of these shared linguistic experiences is in how they cultivate a deeper sense of connection and belonging among the participants. For instance, during university graduation ceremonies, the speeches serve as more than advice. They act as an emotional rallying point, uniting graduates as they embark on life's grand adventure. This underscores the significant role of vocal expressions in fostering a sense of belonging. Now let's delve into the brain's musical pathways and uncover how it processes vocables. Songs rich in vocables play a vital role in reinforcing community bonds and hold special meaning for specific groups. It is likely that individuals from these communities experience a stronger connection to these songs than outsiders. My brain imaging research supports this, showing that individuals from specific communities exhibit a more profound neurological response to these songs compared to outsiders. This experiment examined the brain activation patterns of people from different cultures when listening to songs from a specific ethnic group in Taiwan, a land of diverse musical cultures. I, as a Han Taiwanese, represent the majority ethnic group in Taiwan with my ancestors having immigrated from China over 300 years ago. Alongside this dominant Han culture, Taiwan is also home to a rich indigenous heritage. The indigenous tribes which settled here thousands of years ago now make up only about 2.5% of the population. Despite their minority status, these indigenous communities have had a profound impact on Taiwan's popular music scene over the past decades. Being part of the Han majority, I've noticed a growing admiration within my community for indigenous musicians. This trend has led me to ponder the depth of cultural integration and appreciation among Han fans of indigenous music. Do they truly embrace the indigenous culture, or is their enjoyment more superficial? To investigate this, I designed an experiment using brain imaging techniques to examine the subjective experiences and neural reactions of Han Taiwanese individuals when exposed to indigenous music. The goal was to uncover how cultural affiliation and appreciation are reflected in our neural response to music. The focus of this study was the Puyuma tribe, an indigenous group in Taiwan. 
A preliminary functional magnetic resonance imaging study was conducted using songs from the Puyuma as stimuli. The participants included a Puyuma music fan, a Han music fan of Puyuma music, and a Han individual unfamiliar with and uninterested in these songs. Both fans, regardless of their ethnic background, were familiar with and enjoyed the Puyuma music, unlike the Han individual, who lacked this connection. The experiment revealed diverse neural activation patterns among the participants, suggesting that enjoyment and cultural familiarity significantly influence brain responses to music. One notable song in the study was Song of Puyuma, traditionally performed in vocables, a style characteristic of many Austronesian indigenous tribes in Taiwan, including the Puyuma. These tribes often use extended vocables in their music, a practice not typically found in Han compositions. For those unfamiliar with music heavily reliant on vocables, listening to Song of Puyuma by Samingad, a celebrated Puyuma artist, can be a revelation. This vibrant dance track, rich in vocables and devoid of propositional language, invites listeners to engage physically with the music. If you find joy in listening to this song, it's possible that the brain's reward system and the planum temporal, a region associated with processing music information, might be actively interacting. This interaction was observed in both Puyuma and Han music fans, highlighting the universal yet personal impact of music on the human brain. When sound information reaches the cerebral cortex, it initially undergoes lower-level processing in the primary auditory cortex, located on the superior bank of the temporal lobe. It is then transmitted to the adjacent areas for further processing. The planum temporal, situated posterior to the primary auditory cortex, plays a crucial role in analyzing specific sound features. I will refer to this area as the sound analyzer. When we discuss two brain areas interacting closely, we mean that their activations exhibit similar trends and changes in intensity. Neuroscientists use a metric known as functional connectivity to analyze the correlation over time between activation patterns of two brain areas. Higher functional connectivity indicates more consistent activation trends between these areas. You might be familiar with the reward system, an ancient structure located beneath the cerebral cortex, essential for experiencing motivation and pleasure. This reward system responds not only to basic stimuli like sex and food, but also to enjoyable music. 
When the reward system interacts closely with the sound analyzer, it often indicates that an individual's pleasure is strongly connected to sounds, particularly enjoyable music. In our experiment, both fans exhibited a close interaction between the reward system and the sound analyzer while listening to Song of Puyuma. In contrast, the non-fan did not show this pattern and described the song as somewhat noisy. When a song evokes happiness, the activation in the reward system tends to be consistent across different ethnic groups. This is because the neural pathways associated with basic emotional responses, such as pleasure and reward, are universally similar in humans. However, when it comes to a deeper understanding of a song, the brain activity varies significantly, especially between native listeners and those unfamiliar with the song's context. To comprehend a song deeply, several brain regions are typically involved beyond the primary reward system. Based on my research, this deeper comprehension is reflected in the functional connectivity between three areas in the temporal lobe and the sound analyzer. These areas include the middle section of the superior temporal sulcus, its anterior part, the anterior temporal lobe, and further forward, the temporal pole. In the experiment, when the Puyuma fan listened to Song of Puyuma, there was a notable interaction between the middle section of the superior temporal sulcus in her right brain and the sound analyzer. This pattern was not observed in the two Han participants. It's important to note that this difference was not due to the Puyuma fan understanding the lyrics, as Song of Puyuma contains no Puyuma language, but is sung entirely in vocables. Previous research has indicated that the middle section of the right superior temporal sulcus shows increased activation when listening to singing, as opposed to speech. Therefore, the close interaction with the sound analyzer in the Puyuma fan might signify a deeper understanding of the sung vocables. Although the Han fan was quite familiar with and fond of the song, his limited understanding of the rules for combining vocables and integrating musical melodies with vocables could account for the difference in brain activation patterns compared to the Puyuma fan. Moreover, when the Puyuma fan listened to Song of Puyuma, there was significant interaction between the sound analyzer and her right anterior temporal lobe, extending to the temporal pole. This pattern was absent in the Han participants. The right anterior temporal lobe is known for processing sentence-level intonation, which is vital for understanding emotionally charged phrases or sentences. Additionally, the right temporal pole is instrumental in discerning and interpreting others' emotional states through nonverbal cues, such as intonation, facial expressions, gaze and body posture within social contexts. Thus, the Puyuma fan, when hearing the vocables, likely understood the emotional content of the entire vocal phrase, contextualizing it within a communal gathering. Post-experiment, the Puyuma fan reported vividly imagining dancing with others, with specific movements, synchronized to the music. Although the participants' pool in this study was quite small, I hope that the findings will guide future research in this area. I'm looking forward to future research that will reveal the neural mechanisms behind the varied reactions elicited by songs rich in culture-specific vocables among individuals from different cultural backgrounds. Vocable singing is a common tradition in many cultures globally. For instance, Native American music extensively incorporates vocables in both its sacred and secular compositions. This practice has attracted significant academic interest, leading to the development of models that explain the rules for selecting and combining vocables in Native American singing. Many ancient songs across different cultures utilize vocables as a means to convey emotions. Future comprehensive cross-cultural research should delve into how people sing with vocables, their interpretations of these songs, and the feelings they experience from such music. Turning our attention to the animal kingdom, we find a remarkable parallel in the role of vocal signals. Animal vocalizations not only express individual emotions and intentions, 
but also influence the very fabric of group dynamics. For instance, alarm calls among animals are not just indicators of fear or alertness. They also elicit collective actions such as fleeing or defensive behaviors. These vocal signals are crucial in mediating emotions and intentions within animal group dynamics, influencing collective actions and decisions. This element of animal communication mirrors certain human cultural practices. When humans sing with vocables, it often fosters a sense of community and suggests future collaborative actions. This underscores the link between music and social interaction, highlighting how vocal expressions in both humans and animals serve to coordinate group activities. The connection between music and social interaction has been highlighted in a meta-analysis of functional magnetic resonance imaging studies focused on music perception and social cognition tasks. This research pinpointed specific brain regions, ranging from the primary auditory cortex through the anterior temporal lobe to the inferior frontal gyrus, as overlapping neural pathways for both music perception and social cognition. Notably, within the left hemisphere, these areas constitute what is known as the ventral stream of speech perception, also referred to as the what stream. This stream is pivotal in converting sounds into meaningful concepts. Importantly, similar structures are present in both hemispheres of the brain. They constitute the so-called auditory ventral stream, reflecting a broader, more integrative role of these brain areas in auditory processing. The auditory ventral stream is involved in processing both spoken and sung voice as well as instrumental music in both social and musical contexts. The anterior temporal lobe and temporal pole which showed enhanced interaction with the sound analyzer in the Puyuma fan while listening to the song of Puyuma are key components of the auditory ventral stream. The distinct roles of the left and right hemispheres in processing interpersonal communication are critical in neurolinguistics. The dominant hemisphere of the brain, which is typically the left hemisphere in most people, is mainly responsible for language proficiency. This hemisphere exhibits a higher degree of functional lateralization for language compared to non-human animals. In the majority of individuals, the left hemisphere is particularly adept at processing the semantic and grammatical aspects of propositional language. Conversely, the right hemisphere plays a crucial role in interpreting the musical elements of speech, such as tone, rhythm, tempo, pauses, and intensity, all of which contribute to speech prosody. Prosody is vital in conveying various meanings and emotional tones, even when the same sentence is used. Clinical research indicates that both aprosodia, a deficit in perceiving speech prosody, and amusia, a difficulty in understanding music, may stem from a shared cause. This common origin is believed to be damaged to the right ventral auditory stream, a part of the brain responsible for processing the rhythmic and melodic components found in both speech prosody and music. In the realm of voice processing, the right hemisphere has a unique role in deciphering emotions and musical melodies. There's a notable overlap in the brain areas of the right hemisphere that are involved in processing both emotional prosody in speech and musical melodies. This suggests a foundational similarity between these two aspects of communication. Musical melodies can be seen as artistic expressions of emotional intonation, mirroring the way emotions are conveyed through the prosodic features of speech. The simple humming of la-la-la or the babbling da-da-da can be thought of as the right brain's language. The right brain, particularly through its auditory ventral stream, is adept at processing these vocables. This aligns with the observation that in the Puyuma fan, the right ventral stream demonstrated increased interaction with the sound analyzer while listening to the song of Puyuma. This enhanced connectivity was specific to this native listener and was absent in non-natives. Non-native listeners might miss an essential element when experiencing this song, a sense of belonging, the warm embrace of being part of the indigenous tribe's social network and cultural history. Moreover, in the Puyuma fan, there was heightened functional connectivity between the sound analyzer 
and regions involved in sensory motor processing. This pattern not present in non-native listeners suggests that the Puma fan might be mentally participating in the group dance associated with the song. These observations indicate that while non-natives can become familiar with indigenous songs rich in vocables, their comprehension often remains on a surface level. Cultural outsiders are likely to miss the profound layers of meaning that indigenous listeners perceive and experience. While these interpretations are speculative, they underscore the value of brain imaging research in uncovering how culture shapes our brain, cognitive processes and emotional engagement with music. As a Han Taiwanese, I am not indigenous, but I hold a profound appreciation for the indigenous culture, viewing it as an important cultural heritage that deserves to be cherished and respected. In Taiwan, Han scholars who study indigenous music often regard the vocables in these songs as mere nonsensical syllables, essentially words devoid of content. This approach appears to be somewhat hand-centric and influenced by left-brain-centric thinking. To gain a fuller understanding, those with a dominant left-brain perspective or hand-centric view should be more open to the insights of the right-brain and indigenous perspectives. The Amis, Taiwan's largest indigenous tribe, have their own views on vocables. Nika, an Amis singer, shared her thoughts. I've always been skeptical that the ancient melodies of the Amis can be fully explained by mere nonsensical syllables. If songs filled with vocables are truly meaningless, why have we continued to sing them? Could these songs, unchanged for centuries, be a language that we've forgotten? This perspective suggests that the tradition of singing vocables among Taiwanese indigenous people might represent a crucial link in the evolution of human language. It could hold insights into how music influenced the development of language an idea inspired by psychologist Stephen Brown's hypothesis that early humans may have used ritualized group vocalizations to foster emotional connections, which eventually paved the way for propositional language. Melody in music and intonation in language both involve pitch variation and rhythm. It's likely that early human communication included these elements in group chants, influencing language development. Taiwanese indigenous songs with their use of complex vocables such as Ho Hai Yan and Na Lu Wan bring a complexity that surpasses basic tones like La La La. These complex vocables, forming sequences akin to sentences, suggest that early human vocalizations might have experimented with diverse sounds and syllable connections in melodic group chants. Although these ancient vocalizations lacked clear semantic content, they likely contributed to the development of phonemic diversity, phrase structure, and intonation in language evolution. Hence, understanding these vocable-rich songs is essential for insights into language development and the connection between language and music. Labeling the vocables in Taiwanese indigenous songs as mere nonsensical syllables by Taiwanese Han is an oversimplified view. This perspective is too focused on the semantic aspect of words, overlooking the true essence of vocables. It's like using a city map in an ancient forest. You'd likely get lost. In contrast, Taiwanese indigenous scholar Pane Mulu views vocables as words carrying music. This shows a deeper understanding, like a local guide who knows paths in the ancient forest and can uncover its treasures. The true value of vocables. Pane Malou's study on indigenous vocables resonates with my hypothesis that vocables are a form of proto-language. This connection is particularly evident in two aspects. 
First, indigenous vocables are often sung to infants and young children, suggesting their primal nature. Although the full extent of infants' comprehension of vocables is unknown, it's possible that their right auditory ventral stream is already responsive to these sounds. A brain imaging study has shown that the right anterior temporal lobe and temporal pole in infants' brains exhibit greater activation for human voices relative to non-voice environmental sounds. This finding suggests that even at a few months old, the right auditory ventral system may be processing certain socio-emotional aspects of human voices. Moreover, Mulu indicated that indigenous vocables convey special emotions, including communion with deities and ancestors, a sense of belonging and identity within one's tribe, unity during labor or rituals, joy in social gatherings. Notably, they are also used for private emotional expression. This concept reminds me of the vocalizations found in the animal kingdom, such as the howling of wolves. Much like human songs filled with vocables, the howls of wolves serve as a significant medium for reinforcing social connections and expressing emotions. Wolves typically howl as a group before and after hunting together, symbolizing unity and coordination. Additionally, they howl when isolated, a behavior often interpreted as an expression of solitude or a call for connection with the pack. This tendency to vocalize feelings of separation is also observed in domesticated dogs, known to howl in the absence of their owners, reflecting their social nature and attachment. The comparison of vocalization as a form of emotional communication across species is supported by neuroscientific evidence. Brain imaging studies show that in both dogs and primates, the bilateral temporal poles are involved in the processing of conspecific social vocalizations. This suggests a shared evolutionary origin for voice areas in these species. While there are parallels between human and animal emotional vocalizations, coordinating group vocalizations during communal labor are predominantly a human phenomenon. The rhythm inherent in these human vocalizations is crucial for synchronizing group efforts, thereby enhancing teamwork and safety. This practice of aligning collective actions through vocalizations is not commonly observed in the animal kingdom. Beyond their practical function, these vocalizations also strengthen social bonds and stimulate excitement. This concept is exemplified in the Taiwanese song, Su Lan is Getting Married. This song originated from a Japanese fisherman's work song, sung while hauling nets. After its introduction to Taiwan, it transformed into a Taiwanese version. The original Japanese lyrics were changed, but the unique shouts were kept. These shouts now mimic the call of the bride's sedan chair bearers. This shows how coordinated group vocalizations can be adapted and recontextualized in different cultural settings. As we wrap up this chapter, it's understandable if you still find the concept of emotional language processed by the right brain somewhat perplexing. After all, trying to explain non-propositional language using propositional language is a challenging task, akin to scratching an itch through a shoe. For a direct experience of the mysterious power of vocables in music, I recommend listening to Return to Innocence by Enigma, a German music group. Released in 1994, this song was selected as a theme for the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. It masterfully merges propositional language in its verses with non-propositional language in the chorus, which is entirely made up of vocables sung by Taiwanese indigenous musicians. This blend offers a unique opportunity to reflect on how our musical poetic mind processes both semantic content and emotional resonance within a song.